Welcome to Suffolk Matters, where all of Suffolk County meets the men and women of Suffolk AME. News, opinions, and insights you won't hear anywhere else. Here's your host, the president of New York's largest independent union, Suffolk AME's Dan Leveler. Welcome to another edition of Suffolk Matters on Walk 97.5 and 94.3 The Shark, where Suffolk County meets the men and women of Suffolk AME. News and views you can't hear anywhere else. So my guest this morning is Nick DiBello. He's a vice president at AME and a former caseworker over at the Department of Social Services. Nick, good morning. Thank you for joining me. Dan, thank you so much for having me. You know, I want to start out. There's so many things we can talk about, but I want to start out with like a little bit of a personal moment between you and I, uh, just to kind of set the stage, the, the kind of guy I know you are, and, and, um, and say, you know, we, we had an opening up at AME. Uh, I wanted to bring you on board, and so I called you at home during dinner. And you were like, hey, you know, surprised to get a phone call from me. And I'm like, can I speak to your wife? And you're very confused. And you put your wife on the phone. And I spoke to her and I said, listen, I'm thinking about bringing Nick up and I want to talk to you first. And the reason I did that was because I knew I was asking more than, you know, I want him to change the location of his job. This is not what I was doing. You know, he used to drive to this building and work seven hours. And now he's going to drive to this other building and work seven hours. I was asking a lot from you. And you and I share that similarity in that, you know, we give our all, right? And so it, I was asking more uh, more than just you, you know, changing your normal work hours and to, to, to work somewhere else. I was asking you to take time and energy and focus attention away from your family because this job is very, it, it, it's very involved and things are always going on. And if you're like me, which I know you are, your phone's going off before you're even out of bed in the morning. Uh, and that continues well into the night, text messages, emails, everything. So nine, ten o'clock, you're finally getting done. And when you're sitting down with the family, you're there, but you're not necessarily all the way there. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's the kind of guy I know you are because I know myself and I can see in you, you know, we, we share that quality. Uh, but you were, you were formerly over at the Department of Social Services. And just tell us a little bit about what you did there and what that work was like. Yeah, so I started at the Department of Social Services as a caseworker. I worked in foster care. Um, so after the investigative teams would go out, if they deemed that a child was in uh, was neglected or abused to an extent where they sh- couldn't remain where they were, right. they placed them into foster care. And it was our responsibilities to, one, make sure the foster parents were providing for them, taking care of them but also to work concurrently with the parents to try to fix whatever the problems were that led to the children, you know, coming into care. With the goal always to, you know, I guess the main focus in any of the conversations we've had is bring the kids back to the parents. The goal is ultimately to try to return. Um, Unless it was something that was so egregious where obviously, you know, natural reasons. But, um, you know, we work so hard to to make those returns happen. Part of it is making sure that the schooling is good, making sure the daycare is provided for if they're younger making sure the foster parents taking them to medical appointments and visitation is so crucial in the, the return to children. And, uh, that's a, that's something we, we now have caseworker assistance. Uh, they work with the caseworkers. They, they're the ones who more or less do the visits from week in week out until parents are able to get on supervised visitation. Right. Um, but I know caseworkers themselves, we, we always take great pride when we have the opportunity, the case is so large. We don't always get to do those visits ourselves, but there was nothing, that felt better than when you were getting closer to allowing uh, more unsupervised or an unsupervised visit to be able to go in, watch the visits occur, and you know really engage with the family and the children to, to try to help out as best you can. We talk a lot on this show about the altruism, the AME members, but you know municipal workers in general, uh, and and the focus is always on you know yeah I need a job somewhere, I need something to do with my time, I want to you know be gainfully employed, be part of society, but you know the people that find themselves in public service, they want to give back to the community. Those are people, you know, on off hours that are, you know, uh, basketball coaches or literally, you know, like they do all of these different things, you know, volunteer in the fire service, all of, all of these different things that give back to the community. It's, it, it's in their nature to want to be that way. They're civic minded, I guess you could say. And, you know, this department really exemplifies that. You can't talk about a group of people, looking to help the community more than those helping those that are vulnerable. And when we talk about vulnerable and we talk about kids, you know, sometimes we talk about government and we talk about taxpayers and we talk about, you know, 
but you know, sales tax, sales tax dollars coming from kids that aren't working, you know, that, that, you know, the, the fact of the matter is the population over at DSS, regardless of who they're serving are serving people that desperately need help. And, and the focus there is to make the overall community better, lift people out of bad situations and place them into better ones. Uh, and, and it's, it's those people that society's forgotten about, right? Uh, some people don't need help. They, they get along just fine. Other people do need help. And for whatever reason, uh, these AME members and municipal workers in general all across the board uh, tend to be focused on those issues and tend to be focused on their community. I mean, do you agree you find that to be the case with your coworkers? Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, when you talk about the Department of Social Services, it, it's so vast. I think the community more or less always thinks of uh, caseworkers, right? Like we right. have these caseworkers. There's sometimes these these big media cases that get attention, sure. um, but there's so many people outside of that casework profession that work within the department that do so much work for the community. Um, you know, I was just talking to a leader last night. He works for Child Support Enforcement Bureau. Yeah. Uh, represents the Child Support uh, Enforcement Specialist, and those are the people who, when there's orders made in court and you have a single parent who's, you know, who's obtained custody but looking for financial support from the other parent, the non-custodial parent, it's our members' jobs to make sure that that's processed in a timely fashion so that way the child or children in that, that family are getting what they need financially. And that prevents, you know, that, that single parent from having to then turn back around, go to the Department of Serv Social, <laughs> Social Services, Social Services yeah, yeah. Huh? and ask for temporary assistance. So, uh, you know, as I, I think we're going to talk about later, more of DSS and what the struggles they're facing at at the right. centers. Mm -hmm. The work that CSEB does has such an intricate part to ensure that uh, there's less backlog at the centers and less sure. lines. And, you know, I find also, I'm going to get into like a, a little weird area, but I do find also, and I think, you know, speaking with all members that do this this work and then speaking to people across the country, I've, I've met through my career, I've met people from other jurisdictions, other states, and we've had these conversations. And there's a bit of a stigma on social services in the sense that like, oh, well, you know, we're helping all these people. Why can't they help themselves and whatever else? And uh, there tends to be a focus on, you know, the, the, the needs of, of the less fortunate that are met through the government where, where things are so bad that the government has to step in and help its own people, which is really the mandate of government in the first place. Uh, and, then, and then we forget, you know, putting my union hat on and we're forgetting all of the corporate welfare that's out there. And when you look at the billions and billions of dollars in tax breaks and special bonuses and all of the different laws and rules that we change to put more money into already deep pockets, and then you look at something like social services, it's a drop in the bucket. But the average person on the street will have no problem with Elon Musk making an extra $100 billion, but they will have a huge problem with someone getting $25, $50, 60 70 whatever, you know. Uh, in, in assistance because they literally can't survive without it. And, and, and they have to meet, by the way, the government criteria, which is not necessarily easy, easily you know, met, right? You have to be in a pretty bad situation to get these services. And I feel for our members because, again, altruistic, community-minded, and yet, you know, the stigma in the world is negative. And, you know, recently we had this Newsday article and we were talking about social services, and so it's something that people can tend to have a problem with generally speaking, like, oh, why do people need help and why do we have assistance for people and whatever else? So I wanted to call out the fact that, you know, generally speaking, the people who are taking more money out of the everyday person's pocket, we don't seem to have a problem with. And the little tiny bit that we collectively chip in to make our communities better has a negative stigma attached to it. So that article kind of cut in a bunch of different directions. We'll talk about the article itself, and then I want to talk about, you know, some, some of the feelings I had on it. But, uh, you know, recently Newsday had had an article about, about SNAP benefits. And why don't you go into a little bit about what that article said and, and, and you know, what the, what the realities of, of that work is. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you uh, did an excellent job articulating how uh, our membership feels and what they do and how they provide. Uh, our social service examiners who work in these centers uh, from Riverhead to Coram, Southwest, Smithtown, um, they're that front face that gives these community members who don't have much that ability to, to live, to, to try to get to the next better spot in life. And they've done it over the last few years over so many different challenges. I mean, obviously throughout the pandemic, uh, sure. the client benefit social services examiners did not have any kind of schedule that allowed them to have every other day off. They didn't get to work remotely. 
they were interfacing with the community during the worst of times. Sure. Then we come to a, a point in time where they're so backlogged, but they have to learn a new computer system for time tracking, right. uh, which takes their office assistants who are doing a lot of support uh-huh. for them away from the mission at hand, which is providing services to the community. And it just goes on and it snowballs. Um, and these guys just have been so focused on making sure those benefits go out. And, and, you know, you referenced that, you know, we have big businesses making big profits and nobody has a problem with that. But we have examiners who are trying to do their best to provide financial assistance for people who don't have it. I've got examiners who call and, me. And by the way, they're providing financial assistance to people who are looking to be self-sustaining, right? Absolutely. Their goal, the individuals receiving the benefit, want nothing more than to never need it again. Absolutely. I mean, I have uh, a, a, a very close friend who tells me all the time about having to deny a single mother who got a job. She's working. She's trying to support her child because she overqualifies for a benefit by $14. And the amount of stress that goes on that worker's mind, because in her head, she's like, oh, my God, I wish I could just give it to her. But she doesn't govern it. It's not her rules right. to play within. Mm-hmm. You know, she's just got to follow them. And There's a stress ca- to that. And you carry that home with you. Like I said, when I what, you know, I started the show off very particularly talking about that phone call I made back to your wife when mm-hmm. I asked you to, to join up. Uh, government workers, it's the same thing. You take it home with you. You feel it and and and. and and you live with it, yeah. It's not just a, a job. It becomes a lifestyle for people. And sure. the amount of calls we get, and I'm, I'm glad you uh, referenced the call to my wife. I think of my son, Nico, when he was little, and uh, I used to rock him to sleep. And he always used to say, five more minutes, Daddy. Like, just stay five more minutes. So I'd, I'd give him the five more minutes, yep. and that would eventually be 10 or 15. Sure. I'm a sucker for that stuff. But I find myself, as they get older, since I've had this position, when I say five more minutes, it's because I'm on the phone with somebody. I'm helping another member. I'm trying to yeah. service a family that's in need, just like our examiners do that we've been talking about exactly. and highlighting. It exactly. doesn't stop. There's so many people who need something. And maybe in that moment, it's just a simple answer uh, to a benefit question. Maybe it's something more complex with respect to uh, contractual violation where they need help trying to figure out which angle they're going to take with right. that. Or, yeah. or maybe mm-hmm. it's just a personnel issue where they're just having a conflict with a boss and they want to figure out the best way to get through that. Yeah. But whatever it is, we take those calls and we help. And, yeah. and sometimes people just need an ear. And that's that's okay too, right? Yep. You need to talk to somebody that understands the issue and hears you out. And whatever those whatever those calls may be and whatever the end result is, uh, that's, our, that's our function. That's our, our purpose. We talk about unions in general. Uh, and you had just mentioned, you know, this new computer system and how that impacted a bunch of people that were really trying to do a great job and focusing on – an insurmountable task, almost 600 people short that department. There's about 1,800 positions to be filled in the department, and almost 600 of them are vacant. Uh, And this is as of the proposed budget last year, right? So we're we're talking about empty positions. How did the workload build up and everything else? Now you add to that this new computer system and whatever. Unions, jobs, you know, sometimes people think negatively of unions, but unions, jobs— to question the narrative, right? Somebody gets out, they put this article out in the newspaper and they're smiling on the front page and waving their hand. They say, hey, we fixed the world's problems. We're getting this new computer system and we're going to put it in and everything's going to be better for everybody and let's all celebrate. And it's our job to go in and say, well, is it going to be good? Are we sure it's going to be good? Yep. Because we have these problems. And, and, and so while sometimes unions are labeled as, as you know, I, 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 don't, I don't want to say quite belligerent, um, but, you know, we, we're there to stand in the way of the official narrative. You say, hey, this is going to be great for everybody. We're going to put this new computer system in. Okay, how does it work? Who does it? When does it get done? What are the things that don't work with this? And what are the changes we're going to make? And let's run the old system and the new system side by side until such point in time that we know the, the new system can handle it, and then we'll switch over. And when we don't do that, we fight for that, and then when management goes ahead and does it anyway, now what you end up with is not, you know, we weren't we weren't being difficult for no reason. Yeah. We were being difficult because we understood 1.6 million people in Suffolk County, and some of those people desperately need government's help, and, and most people rely on government. Almost everybody relies on government for its utility functions. Absolutely. And when we gum up the works, works of government to put some flashy article out about a new computer program that is supposed to work but doesn't, all of a sudden, everything slows Everything slows down. And everything slows down in a department that should have 1,800 people on the payroll and has 1,200 people on the payroll. So 
I'm not really surprised that this article happens. And it gives us an opportunity to talk about what it is labor unions do, what it means to be somebody that's represented with thinking about these issues before they happen to you, right? Your, your union is looking for problems down the road that haven't happened to you yet. Yep, and I think uh, you've done an excellent job trying to champion for these positions. So this article just came out, but it doesn't mean it's the first time it's been spoken about. No. This has been ongoing for years, talking to legislators about it, the prior administration. I think one of the things that's uh, very refreshing, one of the rewards of this job that I've seen is the outcome of our most recent county executive election. So with Mr. Romain winning, we feel like we have a partner in government here. Yeah. Going to the different job sites, we feel like we have somebody that's going to listen to the workforce mm-hmm. and hear what we're saying with respect to the needs of the membership and and, right. and leading. Because we have the experts in all of government. They're the ones doing the work day in, day out. So having a voice at that table when people are making decisions on how are we going to implement uh, whatever the system might be, whether right. it's a new time tracking system, whether it's, it's, it's providing benefits, you should try to speak to the people doing the work to see how it will... Right. You yeah, know, impact yeah. them and their abilities to get it done. What time do Service we open the, the doors in the morning? What time do we close at the end of the day? Do we need to stagger shifts? Do we have to have people take lunch breaks at different times so all these needs are met? Uh, you know, these are all important issues, and they have an impact on the overall end product. And our members care about that end product because they care about the residents, right? That's, that's really what's going on here. So when we fight for our members, we're actually fighting for everybody that lives, works, and visits, you know, vacations, whatever it may be, uh, here in Suffolk County. And this this is happening nationally. Anywhere where you've got union representation, that's the goal. That's what's really going on behind the scenes. And it's uh, pretty incredible. I was, yesterday I had a trip over to the Suffolk Community College, uh, swearing an officer. Right. So we have a custodian who's just very much set on trying to help his colleagues better improve their working conditions, better improve their quality of life. And I'm seeing these hallways knowing how, they're a bit understaffed at present due to, you know, budget issues going on at the college. Right. They're working through that, but they're just talking about needing some assistance, needing the tools to make the place look presentable for the students that are going in and having their classes. And I got to tell you, the place looks stellar as it was. These guys work their, their yeah, behinds yeah, yeah. off. Yeah. They take they take pride in it. That's the college's building. It's the community's building, but it's, it's our members' building. Like, yeah. That's like being at home for them. Right. And, and this is this is something I've talked about. When we get into issues like, you know, all of these different maintenance titles and there's all these different groups of people inside of government that maintain certain things. It's easy to talk about grounds and buildings and stuff like that, but it doesn't just have an impact on the worker who very much cares and takes pride in what that building may look like, but it impacts the people that work there. When you're in a building that is not so great looking, is not well maintained, and maybe even at points in time have some sort of hazards, right? There's a spill and nobody deals with it and you could slip and fall, whatever, as a simple example. But then the last part of that little chain there is it has an impact on the morale of the people, right? You pay all these taxes all year long and you may not know what every line is and what every line means, but you know a lot of money came out of your pocket to keep government working. And then you show up at a government building and it looks like it's been abandoned for 10 years, 12 years, let's say. Uh, seeing a building that looks like that makes you just unconsciously, it's human nature, to question, why am I paying all this money? What what is all this money for? I should walk up to a building that is pristine, where people are there greeting me with a smile on their face, ready to listen to my problem, help me resolve my issue, because all of this money came out of my pocket to provide for this machine, and yet now I'm going to a place that looks like it's been abandoned, and the morale is not good, but let's talk about why the morale is not good. We don't have enough people. Yep. We don't have enough people. People don't want to work for government because government hasn't taken care of the people that have been working for it. Years and years ago, it was the job to have. People would wait on lists for years just for the opportunity to get a job with government. And if you were one of the fortunate few, you did okay. You didn't get rich. You did okay. Uh, but you knew you were taken care of in retirement. You knew you had health benefits. You knew you had all of this stuff. And the erosion of those rights... And, and the diminishment of that, and, and not just the private sector, but now other, other government localities improving their benefits, their pay, make it so it's hard to staff these departments. It's hard to have enough custodian work, custodial workers. Getting back to the Newsday article, talking about SNAP benefits, the people that work in Medicaid, and generally anywhere inside of DSS, yeah. health department, public works, all of these major functions of, of, of local government, mandated functions of government, 
understaffed, um, and 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 therefore the taxpayer coming by, they get to a building, it doesn't look the best, the people seem like they're they're beaten down, and this is the effect of of these little decisions. We talked about how you know picking a particular computer system yep. may have an impact on uh, on all of the work that gets done, right? All of those little policy decisions where we seem like we're being a pain, but we're actually trying to make the government better on behalf of not just the workforce, but for the people that the workforce are, are working for, the, the people, right? We the people, right? Yep. That's who we're working for. Um, and that impact uh, of, of those little decisions having an impact on the workforce, now, now you see and you're going to feel, I think, in Suffolk County, a change, right? There's a new administration with a new focus, with open ears, uh, tons of experience, right? You know, decades worth of knowing how to make government work, uh, listening and trying to solve for these problems. That's why you see in this Newsday article a, a difference in tone, right? The, the, the union is saying we need to hire more people. We need to fix this problem. And here's how we think we fix this problem. And management saying we need to hire more people. We need to fix this problem. And we are on the same page on how to fix the yeah. problem. That's the impact. And, and you'll start to see that have an effect, right? You know, right out of the gate, you'll see, you know, a couple of Newsday articles here and there and whatever else. But all of a sudden, managers are going to start to feel the difference. And they're going to realize when they need something and they bring it forward and they ask, you know, the administration, hey, you know, we're out of paper. We need more paper. And the administration says, okay, let's see where we can find you paper. You know, yeah. we're going to get you paper. Whereas maybe in the past you were scared to ask for paper because you might get yelled at because, hey, we don't have money for paper. And what are you guys doing? Where's all the paper going? Now I want you to, you know, audit every single piece of paper. I know of a department where you had to ask for a piece of paper to make a copy. And if you wanted to make two copies, you had to ask for two pieces mm -hmm. of paper. And you had to justify yourself. So we had public employees asking the asking the, the residents when they came in, hey, can you make a copy of this and bring it back because we don't have access to paper? Think about how that looks, right? Think yep. about how that feels. So now you have managers that can ask for a piece of paper and get a piece of paper, therefore they can give it to the workers, and that frees some stuff up. And now you're going to have supervisors starting to understand they can communicate their needs up the chain. Yep. So managers, uh, commissioners, supervisors now, everybody communicating up the chain, having someone listen, understand, and looking to solve the problem, and also looking to work with the union to find fixes that work for everybody. That's going to have an impact on all the residents. You're going to see this government turn around. If this if, if this pattern continues, you're going to see this government turn around. I believe that wholeheartedly. And I think there is a morale issue that happens with how our workforce as a whole, not just DSS, but the entirety of the workforce has, because they've been asked to do more with less for so long. There's a, there's a, a strain to that. I, our workforce is going to, and they do continually at, at present levels. They work through their breaks. They work through their lunches. They stay a few minutes later. They come in a few minutes earlier, uncompensated time working because they're focused on the client on the other side who's in their most desperate moment, the person who needs that heap assistance, that needs food, uh, that needs housing. You know, They want to make sure those people get the services they need. And when you look at the DSS staff, the examiners that were highlighted in that article – you know, they, their, their responsibilities, their job specs have almost morphed out a little bit more. Now they're doing more social work type of work because we want to see our residents get the benefits they receive, whereas their jobs used to be more or less yes or no based on what you gave as information you qualify, qualify or you don't. Right. Now we've got examiners who are following up with calls. They're following up with emails. They're following up with letters. They Drilling they down, yeah. They want to make sure that you're getting whatever it is that you can and obviously that takes more time. So when you have that backlog already, but you're asking them to do a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, it's draining. And, you know, having walked through many of those centers right now, they are packed day yep. in and day out. I mean, the lines are out the door yep. and everybody there is in their worst moment. So as that member who's receiving the client, treating them as if, you know, today just started, it's all rosy, everything's going to be great. And trying to make that client feel the same way that client might have just gone through some really bad things that put them out on the street, made them homeless. So right. maybe their response to our member isn't quite as great as we'd like it to be. But yet we maintain that professionalism. We try to help them as best we can. And what you don't want is after you service a client and you provide for them, and maybe you had a negative interaction to maybe have a supervisor come in who's feeling very drained because maybe you didn't get enough of your numbers done for the day. Right. And they're almost treating you the same way the client just did yeah. um, because of the stresses they're getting from the top. So it does have that effect. 
when you don't have enough people where everybody's, you know, feeling a little more yeah. tense, a little more stressed yeah. out. And, and this is all connected, right? You know, and so you talk about the history here in Suffolk County and, you know, all the financial crises we've had to deal with. Uh, mass layoffs, you had almost 1,300 people laid off out of your government you were paying for, and then now they're gone, and then people retiring, the positions not being backfilled. Uh, you add to that dealing with things like a global pandemic, still caring, still wanting to get things done, but how do you deal with all of this stuff? And so it, when we talk about morale, we're not talking about a bad week, a bad day, a bad month. We are talking about over a decade of morale continuously pushing down, 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 down. So to have leadership, uh, to work with us, uh, listen listen to what's going on in the department to figure out how to best serve the residents of Suffolk County. This is why I take this article as such a positive sign. To have the union and, and to have the administration come in and say, yeah, we both see the problem. We both see it the same way. And we, we both want to fix it. And we already agree on how to get there. Yep. That is, you know, I mean, you know. The article is clear. This is not with respect to our workers not being capable of getting their work done, the article is so very crystal clear. It's that they haven't been provided the tools to get the job done. Sure. You and know? that, and that brings us full circle back to, you say, we mentioned the custodial issue out there. Uh, and, and that custodial issue exists at the college, but it exists at the County as well. And the fact of the matter is if you don't have the tools to get the job done, and when I say the tools, I mean enough workers, the physical equipment they need, uh, enough break time, enough time to rejuvenate themselves, a steady schedule that they can rely on, getting paid on time, uh, being treated respectfully by their by their supervisors and their managers, in in recognizing the good work that they're trying to do for the people of Suffolk County, all of this stuff, you know, it it it, it compounds down to this powder keg, right? And Absolutely. and and diffusing that is definitely high priority. Yep. And it feels like we're there, you know, and uh, I know we're we're closer to being out of time than than having more time in front of us. So here we are entering our 40th year of existence as a union. Um, and, you know, you, you hear the old expression, the calm before the storm. Well, we've been in the storm for quite a while now, and I could actually see the other calm coming on the back end of it. I think we've made such tremendous gains with partners in, in government now, leadership now. Sure. We have... Uh, our members are becoming more engaged than ever. We saw that during the political action process. They wanted cool. to be part of helping to get our endorsed candidates into office because those are the people who have made commitments to help the workers. We needed people that were going to listen to what these issues are and, and the end result everyone's going to feel. Yeah, yep, absolutely. And I, I think there is that positive vibe going on. And, uh, you know, I, I think that anybody who came before us, uh, the jobs that you and I do, representing a, a workforce of over 6,000 people with over 940 job titles, having to know, even with the examiner titles, I mean, you have client benefits, uh, public assistance, temporary assistance, you have caseworkers who do foster care, even within one that do CPS, adult yeah. protective services, yeah. even within one title out of those 940, there are different responsibilities. So for us to have the opportunity to be doing this for a while to continue learning, to have members who want to help us be better leaders by giving us the information we need to have those conversations with the administration about what a, a specific title may or may not need to get their jobs done better and more efficiently. Uh, I say kudos to our members for being engaged, for reaching out to us, for allowing us to know what the issues are because we can't fix something if we don't know it's wrong. Yeah. You know? Honestly, that's, that's how this all works, right? Yeah. So the, the, the idea is that our members communicate to us, these are the things that are going on. We identify problems to fix, and we kind of fold that into, you know, a, a, a global kind of discussion. And we sit down with the administration and we say, okay, here are the problems that we're seeing. Here's the evidence of the problems. Here's ways that you can fix it. We don't just come in and say, hey, you got a problem. You better fix it out. And you got to Wednesday. That's, that doesn't work. Yep. Here's the problems. Here's some some solutions, and let's talk through what works, what doesn't work, and let's help each other get it done. That's what partnership looks like, uh, and that's when unions work best when they're working with the administration to achieve the goals on behalf of the membership that service the community. Right. Yep. And I think one of the greatest growths I've seen over the last few years, especially, is having our local leadership work collaboratively with us to develop the strengths and the skills that they need, where they could try to obtain goals for their workforce within the division in-house, uh, having those conversations before 
there's bigger problems that come of it. So if, if, whether it's a shift change and trying to articulate why that would be a negative, not just for the yeah. workers doing yeah. the work, but also for the community that's being serviced. Yeah. It's good for them to have those in-house conversations before maybe we have to get involved with it. And sometimes yeah. they're successful with the fight. Sometimes they're not. But just taking that first step yeah. allows us to have more flexibility to, to, and to I'll handle bring, multiple issues. I'll bring it full circle again. Like we talked about at the beginning, our job as union reps is to question the narrative. You say, I need to change a shift. Why? Is that necessary? Are you just doing it because? Does it actually solve the problem? Let's sit down. Let's have these conversations. We will help you get there. We want it to. We want it to work because our members want it to work. Absolutely. They want this job to be good. They want to do good for the community. Let's sit down. Let's have those conversations. That's what we're here for. Uh, and 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 again, I I look forward to morale changing to the point where it trickles down through the managers, down to the supervisors, where everybody's working, and we can start focusing on teams yes. and building teams and building each other up to do a better job. As opposed to, you know, there have been times in the past where you got the sense that nobody wanted to talk to anybody about anything for fear of losing their job. And that's not a good environment to get good things done, especially when you deal with a certain level of volunteerism that comes with this this type of work. So Absolutely. my guest this morning, Nick DiBello, vice president at AME, longtime uh, worker over at social services uh, in, in Suffolk County and also all the jurisdictions, uh, has dedicated his life to helping other people continues to do so with AME. Nick, I want to thank you again for joining us this morning. Uh, thank you for inviting me on the show. It was a great opportunity to speak to you and, and the residents of this county and our workforce. Really appreciate it. Yeah. And to our listeners, we'll speak to you next week.